very much. Uh, welcome. Thank you to Colleen Flood for asking me to moderate this event. I've developed a completely unhealthy obsession with the Republican primaries, and I need all the help from substances that I can get. <laughs> explains my interest in this, and uh, I know the healthy attendance at what is otherwise a very press time of year uh, for our students. So uh, this is uh, an incredibly interesting area from a number of doctrinal perspectives in the law as a constitutional and criminal law scholar. There is, of course, an important intersection of both of those uh, areas with respect to the decriminalization and possible legalization of marijuana. It raises division of powers issues. Of course, the issue first came to national attention as a charter issue uh, regarding uh, security of the person under Section 7 with respect to the availability of medical marijuana. But it, it, it has now extended far beyond that. So it's great to have uh, this panel and to have these experts to discuss the issue from a variety of other perspectives. So I'm going to introduce all of them uh, now and then uh, we will uh, proceed with the presentations. Uh, Michael Lickfer uh, has a general corporate commercial practice at Bennett Jones where he advises clients in a broad range of corporate and commercial matters. He is one of Canada's leading advisors in the medical marijuana industry and counsel to the Canadian Medical Cannabis Industry Association. Michael is currently an adjunct professor at Western Law where he teaches medical marijuana law and practice. Of course, he designed and developed with the next participant, um, Hugo and Ann Alves. <coughs> Hugo Alves is also a corporate and commercial lawyer at Anna Jones. He obtained his BA from Carleton University and his JD from the University of Toronto. He is fluent in Portuguese and is a member of the Brazil-Canada Chamber of Commerce, where he acts as a co-chair of the Chamber's Sustainability Committee. He is an active member of his community. He acts for various charitable, not-for-profit, and community-enhancing <coughs> organizations, including the Upside Foundation of Canada, Keys to the Studio, and the Toronto Triathlon Festival. And our third speaker is Dr. Donna DeCampos. She is an adjunct professor here at the Faculty of Law, a research fellow at the Global Strategy Lab in the Center for Health, Law, Policy, and Ethics, and a research associate at both Cambridge and Oxford. So she's really covering a lot of bases. She holds a doctorate in law and jurisprudence from Oxford and a master in international law from the University of San Paulo, Brazil. She researches, researches and publishes in bioethics, legal theory, and moral philosophy. Through her work at the Global Strategy Lab, she aims to develop the field of global health ethics and to help law students understand why there are practical reasons to care about global health ethics considerations and about ethics considerations in general. So I understand that the panelists have previously agreed that Michael and Hugo will each have 15 minutes to present. Um, Thana will have 10. I have a uh, two minute warning for them, and then as I was joking, I have a big hook that I will drag them off. But I'm sure they'll be quite disciplined. And that will be uh, a very generous amount of time for questions. So, uh, first up will be Michael. Thank you. <laughs> um, these are not our slides. Okay. We're going to bring them up as we start talking. So we're here to talk about the future of marijuana law, it be that medical or an adult regulated market. Uh, but in order to talk about the future, I felt like we should talk about the past just a little bit. And in order for you to pay any attention to us, we felt like we should talk about for a minute or two who we are and why we're involved in this space and kind of how we got involved in this space to lend ourselves a bit of credibility so that you can pay attention to the rest of the things we say. So I, I guess let me just offset a little bit about what Mike started. So we are corporate commercial workers. So we're in the business of Canada as opposed to, we obviously in conducting business for our clients, we have to have a a solid understanding of the underlying regulatory regime, the case law surrounding 
cannabis and access to cannabis in, in Canada, but we're primarily, our focus is on the business aspects of, of, of cannabis. So I thought what would be useful, and why Mike and I are up here together, quite frankly, are, is we're gonna divide our presentation up. So we're gonna start by giving you a brief intro, letting you know kind of who we are, how we got started in this, this sort of niche practice area, uh, Mike will talk a little bit about. There we go. Mike will talk a little bit about a brief history and how we got to the MMPR. We'll cover a little bit about the two seminal cases that have come out this year or late last year, early this year. So Smith and Millard. Um, what that really means. We'll talk a little bit about some of the peripheral issues, dispensaries. Um, the, the new proposed sort of smoking vaporizing regulations in Ontario, and then legalization. What, what's next? What that might look like? We want this really to be more of a conversation as opposed to us talking at you. So at any point throughout this, feel free to interrupt us. There you go. Okay, cool. So let me give you a brief intro. Um, so I'll tell you how we got involved in this because you know, we're at a large national firm and as you can imagine sort of starting a marijuana practice is probably not high on their uh, priorities list. Unintended. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm older than Mike, I know it doesn't look that way, but a lot yeah, older. A lot older. <laughs> uh, and I've been through two what I what I call sort of regulatory cycles, but it's not really a cycle at all. It's an instance where there's been a change in regulation or the a new regulation is proposed and it's created a commercial industry. So one was way back when the Kyoto Protocol came into existence, Canada joined the Kyoto Protocol, some clean development uh, some clean development mechanism, joint implementation mechanism were passed and it created an emissions trading system. And uh, we were very involved in that. And then when Canada decided to withdraw from the Kyoto Protocol, a lot of people that were in that industry pivoted, refocused, and it was around that time that the Ontario government introduced the Green Energy Act to create a renewables energy business. So we got into this a little bit by happenstance. We, we, you know, it's going to shock you, but when you leave law school and go into practice, don't pick up the OR of the Ontario reports of the Canada Gazette a lot, but we, we happened to pick up, we saw the word marijuana, uh, and I'm dating myself a bit, but I was in law school when R.V. Parker was, was going on, and so I sort of followed, I wouldn't say religiously, but I followed it, uh, you know, sort of marijuana jurisprudence since then. So we saw the MM, the proposed MMPR regs, read them, and I remember Mike and I were in the office talking about it, and we said, yeah, this is probably going to create an industry, and we should try and be part of it, because under the MMAR, there was a, a heavy focus on regulating patients. Uh, you know, it was the patient that had to go out and, and fill out a, a very long form, two physicians, make a suggestion about how much cannabis you needed. There wasn't really a business there to, to do. We weren't going to start advising people on how to fill out forms. That's not, kind of doesn't fit in with the big firm model. And um, this seemed different. It seemed like the focus was on regulating production and distribution, would create commercial enterprises, and whenever that happens, there is a role for legal services. So the first thing we did is we tried to map out who the players are going to be. And you know, this is, uh, it, it's simplified, but what we, <coughs> the conclusion we made is there's going to be licensed producers and patients as the nucleus. Right? Production, distribution, consumption. And then with any industry, a lot of the, 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 the real interesting commercial work is actually done around the edges. So, so LPs, patients will be the nucleus, and then there will be a bunch of spokes that will come out. So picks and shovels type of businesses like financial, technology, manufacturing. Um, and we said, we don't want to be guys that just act for LPs or patient groups. We want to be real industry experts. So to us, that meant we needed to act for people in every one of these different verticals. So you know, I, my, my other job at the firm is I'm one of the, the leaders of the 
Technology, Media, and Entertainment Group. So we have a big roster of technology clients, and Mike and I started by going through our roster of technology clients and seeing who has something that can vend into this new industry. And we, went and we chatted with a bunch of those people. They were, we were surprised to find they were already, already thinking about the applicability of their technology. A lot of these things were energy efficiency, HVAC related technologies, because HVAC's a, a huge cost in a commercial growing facility, and um, things like water oxygenation. So we went and saw them, and we got some mandates. And then we just got lucky. We got someone that wanted to apply for a license we knew them from a previous life. Mike knew them from a previous life. They said, can you help us? We said, yeah, we know everything there is to know about this space. <laughs> Wasn't really true. And uh, move forward on that basis. So this is kind of, when you're talking about federally regulated licensed producers, this is what the world looks like today. Right? For dried marijuana, which is the way the MMTR started, you have 30 licensed producers. 21 of them can cultivate and sell. Seven can only cultivate. And you're probably going, why would you want to do that? Why well, can't you cultivate and sell? So there, there is an LP whose model is just to cultivate and then sell to another, like a wholesaler, sell to another licensed producer that can sell. That sort of business model is going to come to an end relatively quickly. There's also, it was also an evolution, and there's also sale only, where right. they import product from a parent company in another foreign legal country. Um, but that was an evolution, and so just to go back and, and add an additional point to the previous slide, um, Hugo and I really saw the opportunity where a fresh piece of legislation came out that had zero interpretation, and you have a bunch of people scrambling and saying, well, what does this mean? What does it mean? So. I, you know, I haven't been a lawyer very long, but I feel like that's a rare opportunity in a, at least in a young lawyer's career where an industry is born overnight uh, as a result of a regulatory change, and you have the opportunity to be some of the first people looking at this legislation and trying to interpret what it means and how we can navigate our clients through it. Um, so that, that's kind of where it all came from. The evolution of the cultivation and sale licenses was a reaction from Health Canada where Hugo and I, I think, both agree that we like the way that the government implemented the MMPR. And what we mean by that is they knew it wasn't perfect, but they put it up. And they knew that there were going to be some fixes on the fly. But the, the alternative to that is let's wait another 10 years until it's 100% airtight. Uh, and then release it. So one example of that is when it first came out, when you got a license as a licensed producer, it was a full license to cultivate and sell right away. And what happened was not all the licensed producers that got those initial licenses were in good enough shape to do that. So we dealt with very small amount of recalls, maybe two or three. Um, and then Health Canada, would send around auditors to go and inspect all the facilities. And I think the vibe that initially came from that is, okay, there's a few people that, let's, let's wait and let's see a growth cycle from them. Let's see what they can produce. Let's make sure they're producing the right product before we go and let them sell it to the public. So they broke the licenses out and created a staged process where now you have to kind of show and prove um, your growth, two, two full growth cycles, and then you can get a sales. I will also very quickly um, and shamelessly uh, promote pro bono work because that client that Hugo mentioned that came to us and we got lucky in a sense was because I did a bunch of pro bono work for him the year before. I didn't charge him, he couldn't afford it, and he came, he said, if I ever have something real, I will come back to you. And you know, I was like, sure, whatever. <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna take you out to golf, and none of that ever happened. But a year later, sure enough, he called me back and said, look, I have something real. I've been doing this for a couple months. We need to raise some money now. And that really launched us forward with our first legitimate client. So, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just that, the cultivation sale, they call it the graduated approach. There are two things that really drive me. One, they want to make sure that you're producing the cannabis in accordance with your standard operating procedures and not kind of tweaking them on the fly. They want to make sure 
sure it's standardized and auditable. And the other thing is they want to make sure you have product in the vault ready to go to be able to sell to patients when you register them. Because they, they didn't want access, that's what cannabis law is all about, is providing reasonable access to, to you know, suffer because a patient would register with the licensed producer, place an order, and there wouldn't be any product in the vault. So really quick statistics. Oh, I should say back here. So as a result of the Smith case, the Supreme Court ruling late last year that held that a patient's constitutional right to reasonable access to cannabis includes the right to possess and consume that cannabis in derivative forms, as opposed to smoking dried flour. Uh, Health Canada, we'll talk a, a bit about this, touch on it later, uh, produced some Section 56 exemptions allowing for licensed producers to produce and sell fresh marijuana. Some people want to extract or their own cannabis resin and oils, and also marijuana oils. My view, they got that regime wrong, um, but we'll talk about it later. 20 LPs have applied, there's, there's six production and sale, and 13 production only, one sale only license. This is where I think the majority of existing LPs are focused right now. Like these guys that have a sales license, they've got their procedures down, they're growing, they, they've got their patient acquisition strategies sorted out, they now want to offer a wider range of pros. Um, There's yeah. two decks I sent you, it was 50-50 shot. Updates. <laughs> it's all right. This has been updated since. Yeah. I can pull up the other one if you want. No, no, totally cool, because okay. it's the only slide that's... So this number is really old. So the only thing really that I would... There are certain... Like the MMAR had in 12 years 36 registered, 36,000 registered patients. In two and a half years, the MMPR has 44,000 registered patients as of the end of Jan uh, January 2015. So, tremendous patient growth. Um, and that's directly proportional to physician prescribing attitudes. So, under the MMAR, you know, doctors not didn't, did not really want to prescribe. It was very difficult to get a prescription, uh, both through commercial arrangements and just evolving physician attitudes. There are a greater number of physicians that are willing to prescribe cannabis a viable treatment option to their patients, and that's driven the increase in uh, in, in registered patient numbers. Okay. Emerging commercial arrangements. I'm just going to go and do this really quickly. Okay. Sure. Move forward. So as the industry develops. <laughs> different participants find ways to essentially make money at this. Like that's, you know, you're, you're dealing with a narcotic, so you're very constricted in the way you can advertise a controlled sub substance in Canada. We have a horrible, uh, or obviously our government has a very lax attitude or a very poor record of enforcement. Um, there's a paper written a couple of years ago where I think there's been one instance of a formal enforcement action in the last 10 years. But under the conservative government, that was one of the primary means that they held a stick over people, is to say, if you're going to engage in promotional advertising, we will find ways to punish you for it. And the ways were varied. Uh, a lot of times it was just delays in getting people to come and inspect your grow rooms and things like that. But as the market matures, people find ways to participate. And I won't go through all of these, but I'll just touch on two. Or you know, one is how do you differentiate your product from other people's products? Because at the end of the day, you're growing a plant. There are lots of varied strains and different characteristics, but they have base cannabinoid profiles, and you got to find a way to differentiate your product from other product. Is it organic? Is it tied to some other lifestyle brand association? All licensed producers want a way to sort of differentiate their product in the market and there are people that are working on them. So that's brand development, uh, protection and licensing of genetic materials. Um, the, other, the other thing that's really emerged is everyone was very focused on production. Everyone was focused on, I'm gonna get a license, I'm gonna grow marijuana, and it's gonna sell itself, it's gonna be great. But that's actually in the medical system not true at all, like patient acquisition Finding customers to be the off day is is very, it's a critical piece. It's really what differentiates uh, a successful business from a 
business that struggles. So there have been lots of people that have figured out ways to, we call them patient aggregation by or patient outreach arrangements, but they're either through establishment of standalone specialized cannabis clinic, clinics businesses. Um, there is uh, you know, a group of people like, that operate under a sort of veterans helping veterans banner that try and aggregate veteran patients, which are very valuable in uh, the MMPR because they have higher daily limits and the government subsidizes, pays for the per purchases at a very high dollar per gram. So the average price per gram in the MMPR right now is, covers around $7 and a, a veteran is approved for up to $13. So it's a very, and they can order a lot, they can order up to 10 grams a day. So it's a very valuable patient to have and there's been some smart veterans that have figured out if we sort of facilitate veteran access through some preferred partnerships and then do things like white label arrangements, we can make a lot of money and they, they have. With any highly regulated industry, there's unique risks. Um, I think the biggest risk in this industry is just like the regulation changes all the time. Um, as Mike said, I come, I came from a sort of climate change background, and you know, at a federal level, we waited over a decade to get some regulation in place, and it still hasn't happened. So, I've always been very much in favor of a sort of learning by doing approach when it comes to certain types of regulation. The MMPR is not perfect. You would see that with some of the charter challenges that have happened recently, but it's at least created an industry, people are doing it, and part of the trade-off for that is you have to be willing to accept that as the government learns more, their requirements change. And it's very frustrating to the general public because there's not perfect transparency on that, but that is probably one of the biggest risks. Ongoing regulatory change. Um, regulation is patchwork at a global level. People want to do business with the U.S. Well, they can't cross the border interstate commerce. Federal jurisdiction in the U.S. <laughs> cannabis is illegal, so you got to find smart, you know, clever commercial arrangements to get around that, which usually involve drawing economics by way of leasing property, licensing technology, provision of consulting services, where you're not actually touching the plant and moving the controlled substance across borders. Political and reputational risk, a lot of that involves sort of our international obligations and how we're viewed globally. I don't really, I care comments I'm not going to talk about because one of our panel members is an expert on that. Um, market maturity and impact depth of quality of expertise. So in any new industry, there are early movers, there are high risk tolerance, um, you know, doers, they go out, they want to get something done, and they reap the benefits of that, right? So this is kind of a quality, classified really as kind of like a development community. As the market sort of matures and the reputational risk goes down because the stigma associated with it decreases, and as margins compress due to increased competitiveness, it becomes harder to make a profit. And so what you see is the the, the type of business professional that enters the market also, in, you know, there's sort of increase in, I don't want to say in terms of quality, but just in terms of their ability and experience. And so an example of this is one of the first people that came to see us were some outdoor marijuana farmers from Manitoulin Island. And like they, they drove from Manitoulin Island to our offices in Toronto because they didn't want to use the phone. Um, and, you know, whereas some of our clients now are like the former head of capital markets of Dundee Securities, the former president of Mandy Lake Bank, so you just start to see more seasoned commercial players entering the market. Okay, so Mike, so, why don't you give a brief history? Of sure, we don't have any slides on this, and I'll, I will be brief. Uh, and it's only for those of you who haven't followed along or, or don't know kind of the history of the legislation here. But just by way of background, this all started in the 90s, mid to late 90s. I think Morgenthaler was one of the first cases that touched on Section 7 rights and the government restricting access to certain medications. Um, and by the way, I am not a constitutional lawyer. 
So if I get any of this wrong, just, just pretend I got it right. <laughs> um, and that led to Parker. And Harvey Parker was, was definitely an important case. And again, it, it centered around the government kind of restricting access and infringing charter rights around medication. And in this, in Parker's circumstances, it was marijuana. So there are definitely some, some harsh schools of thought on both sides of the coin on what the court did in Parker and whether they kind of went too far. But um, the court basically said that, that it was unconstitutional for the government to, I mean, they struck down a section of the CDSA and it was unconstitutional to prevent Parker, who had AIDS and he was very sick, um, from allowing him access to marijuana. And the result of Parker, more importantly than me fumbling the exact details of Parker, was the introduction of the MMARs. And the, that system existed up until the MMPR. So without getting into too much detail, and there was a lot of cases along the way that kind of shaped the MMARs and tweaked them uh, based on further challenges. But the MMARs, in a sense, allow, um, you know, briefly allowed you to grow at home and allowed you to designate a grower if you didn't want to grow yourself. The tweaks that came along the way in those 12, 13 years were all related to um, can you pay the grower for growing for you? Uh, if you're a grower, how many patients can you grow for? So there was ratios, and then the ratios became unconstitutional, and the fact that you couldn't pay them became unconstitutional. So just constant challenges and tweaks. Um, and in the background, the development of the MMPR. So the reason why the MMPR came into place and the problems the government saw with the MMARs, um, aside from the very important point that Hugo brought up, which is that it was set up to regulate the patient. And it's important to keep in mind that with the introduction of MMAR, the government never foresaw how large it was going to grow. They thought, all right, we're going to issue some exemptions. Some people are going to grow at home. Um, that program turned into over 30,000 licenses across Canada that it's very, very difficult to regulate. You can't kick down the front door of a medical patient who has a legal right to grow at home to make sure that they're only growing the amount that they're supposed to be growing and that there's no diversion into the illicit market. So those were some problems. Um, diversion into the illicit market was a, was a suggested problem by the government. Public health and safety was another large one that the government alluded to. Uh, there were definitely, and, and a lot of this evidence the government put forth in a lard and the court didn't accept. Um, that being said, we're rewinding in time and, and this is what the government is saying. They're saying that it's a problem for public health and safety, the MMAR program. They're saying that uh, people are finding out about these grow-ups and breaking in and there's violence as a result. And just overall, it, it's just an unruly system. Very, very difficult to regulate. Uh, there's 30,000 or so licenses scattered all over Canada. Um, municipal authorities like the fire department or the police department don't know where they are. So you have grow ops and all kinds of neighborhoods all over the place. So it's proven to be a problem. So that welcomed the introduction to MMPRs, which came into force April 1st, 2014. And what it did was say, okay, all of these licenses where you're growing at home, they're gone. We're stripping all those away, and we're putting licenses now in the hands of large-scale production facilities that are going to be strictly regulated, that have security directives. Their facilities have to be pharmaceutical grade, if not higher. They have to have certain level grade vault and camera equipment, and all the way down to what the frame rates on the cameras have to be for how long they have to store the data. It was an extremely, extremely rigorous process. Um, the application can be very, very expensive. And the government said, look, regulating X amount of those entities is going to be a lot easier than regulating the MMAR, and it'll be a lot safer. Those, those were some of their arguments. And let's put physicians in the role of gatekeepers. 
from now on. So if you want to get a medical document to be able to purchase medical marijuana from one of these licensed producers, uh, you can now go to your family doctor. And so that was kind of the introduction to the MMPR. That was the idea behind it. And Hugo's going to jump in and talk about a pinnacle case that came about right as the MMPR was being introduced that, in a sense, saved, for the meantime, the MMARs and created this parallel uh, nightmarish style track. Um, but that's kind of the history of where the MMARs came from. Uh, Parker's a really important case if you want to check it out, read a summary on it. And then there's a few cases along the way that kind of shaped it, shifted it, um, all leading up to what we have now, which has just been recently declared unconstitutional, but we'll get to that, uh, which is the MMPRs. So, time warning? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll stop All talking right. then. <laughs> All right. So, I have two minutes. So, you're going to get one minute on Smith and one minute on the water. So, uh, so, sorry, this is not the slide deck I have. So, edibles market is really a derivatives market, 67% of the market in the U.S. You know, surprise, surprise, not a lot of people want to smoke. They want to consume it in a derivative form, either an edible or an oil, a, a topical, lots of different products that, that you can consume the, the cannabis with and you know, quite frankly it's healthier for you than combustion. So uh, Smith happened, it was, it was a case about cookies, they found Owen Smith, they raided his house, he had cookies, he had a bunch of, of jars that were labeled lip balm and massage oil. And they, you know, they said this is this is against the law. So they challenged it, and the outcome of this case is it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the unanimous decision, the Supreme Court ruled that, you know, your right to access includes the right to possess and consume cannabis in whatever form you want. How did the government? And, and it, they gave the government um, at the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal found the same thing and gave the government a year. So it's it stayed the. The, the decision in order to give the government a year to come up with regs at the Supreme Court they said you know no year grace you know forget it do it now it's, so the government passed a number of section 56 exemptions under the CDSA and for different classes of people including the licensed producers and you as a patient in my view they got it wrong so as a licensed producer there are a few key things you have to know one You've, you've got to get approval. So you've got to set up a lab, they've got to come and inspect it, they'll approve you for production, and then just like dried product, they want to make sure you can actually produce the oil in accordance with your operating procedures, then they'll give you a sales license. But they've put in a bunch of restrictions. So you only get this Section 56 exemption if you comply with the terms and conditions attached to the exemption. And some key terms and conditions are you can only produce oil with 3% THC content. So we go, what does that mean? Who cares? You can't vaporize 3% THC oil. So that cuts out a huge segment of the market. Um, and you know, the end result is the patient will go to a dispensary or a different source. You can't add any flavor or scent. And you can't, if you can't produce and distribute the oil in a dosage form other than a capsule. So what that's created is a very limited market. Now, if you're a patient, you can buy the oil or the extra, the dried or fresh marijuana, and you can change the chemical composition of it. So you can actually produce very high concentrate. As long as you don't use an organic solvent, something that'll blow your house up. They don't want, you know, they want breaking bad in the house producing cannabis oil. Um, but that is the primary mode of extraction. You know, people will run butane through a turkey baster and stuff with marijuana and then sort of heat off the the, uh, the vapor, the heat off the rest of the butane. So it strikes me as very odd that you're forcing licensed producers to create these expensive, expensive labs operated by professionals in accordance with standard operating procedures that you audit once a month, but you can't, you don't let them produce the same things that the patients at home can produce in totally unregulated circumstances. So, time, book, no time for Allard. Yeah, it wasn't important anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. You can ask this question. Yeah. Yeah.
has its own associated jurisprudence, of course. Um, but once you get into the decriminalization of simple possession per se, then that opens up a whole other ball of wax. The charter issues become different. The division of powers issues become different. Um, it's uh, you know, and there's really some conflicting jurisprudence here because, of course, in Mammal Levine, the Supreme Court said, in fact that simply smoking marijuana as a lifestyle choice is not protected under Section 7. It's not the kind of like that lifestyle choice. You're the Supreme Court judges. Um, that deserve that protection. Uh, but the criminal law did not solely need to be oriented towards harm. Um, and so that leaves the federal government lots of arguments to make. You might think that decriminalizing <coughs> indicates that the federal government no longer has a criminal law basis to say we think this behavior is wrong, but of course, with respect to tobacco regulation and with respect, in fact, to gaming, the federal government maintains considerable regulatory power, even though you might, and I do challenge in some ways the constitutional basis of that, of that um, continued authority. So we're going to have some really interesting um, uh, uh, issues to confront uh, over the next uh, few years as we expand the scope of allowable behavior from medical use of these substances to simply uh, personal use motivated by individual choice. With that, I'm now um, pleased to open the floor to questions, and uh, feel free to direct them to any or all panelists. Yes? Um, I have a question for anyone who's willing to take it. Um, I apologize, I haven't actually looked at the, um, the regulations myself, so I am wondering if um, there's been any pushback from physicians and how uh, either too eager to prescribe or not eager at all to prescribe and how that um, is addressed in the regulations, if at all, or if going forward we perceive that as an issue the same way it has been with other decriminalization of medically related practices like physician assisted dying. Has that been addressed at all? Is that an issue? So if, if a person seeks um, uh, medicinal marijuana and they have a physician who's not willing, what kind of recourse do they Sure. So doctors don't like being gatekeepers for something like this. When the industry started, sort of Mike, myself, and other people in our group, we probably went to about 60 different doctors, just walking, everyone from walking clinics to our family GP to private clinics like Metcan and Cleveland Clinic. And the overwhelming issue that physicians had with it is it wasn't, they didn't really know there wasn't enough information, right? Like they couldn't call up their program and say, okay, you have this, you know, you got a healthy male, this age, age group, this is how many milligrams you provide. And so it was a funny story. First time that I got a prescription, I went to my doctor and he goes, you know, he, I've been here for 15 years, so he knows, okay, you, you don't have a substance abuse problem. If this is something you want to try, I'll prescribe it for you. And he fumbled around, he's got, a, I, I don't know what it is, I guess it's the pharmacopoeia on his computer, and he went through it, and he's like, I'm having a hard time finding any dosage information. I said, well, I mean, look, this isn't scientific, but there's a guy at my office, got the same sort of ailment, he's the one that told me about it, and uh, his prescription was, was two and a half grams a day, which is a lot of cannabis. He goes, is he the same size as you? I go, no, he's way smaller. He goes, I think you need five. <laughs> and five grams a day, and that was the prescription that he wrote me. So there has been in the colleges, the various colleges of physicians and surgeons have all put out guidance about how you need to be conservative in your prescribing. You know, they're generally very reluctant. So doctor physician attitudes, while they become increasingly accepting and willing to prescribe, there is a reluctance, right? And that all stems from the lack of peer-reviewed journal studies about, about cannabis. And the way people have gotten around that, so we have a client that operates the largest network of cannabis-focused medical clinics. And what they've done is their business is based on physician referrals. So they've gone to 3,000 different physicians within sort of southwestern Ontario and said, look, if you have patients that are interested in learning more about whether cannabis is a viable treatment option, or you think the cannabis is a viable treatment option for them, but you don't have the knowledge <coughs> to make the determination as to dosage 
and what sort of questions you should be acting about contraindications or reporting, just like you wouldn't if you know you, you had to send someone to an oncologist or a specialist, send them to our clinics and we'll work with your, with you to provide you with information about your patient. And they've done that. So it ranges from the highly professional in that sense to the ad in the back of Nell magazine where you're going to get someone saying, you know, Skype me and I'll prescribe you some cannabis for a fee, which, you know, the colleges have a very serious issue with. Like the doctors in Ontario are prohibited from taking fees to write a prescription. Although uh, the Canadian Medical Association in the past has been very much against it, um, I think they've been changing a little bit there. The way the, the oh. phrase the question, but I think they uh, they've been very explicit about uh, not being uh, in favor of. I think it's important to note too, and I tread very carefully with so many health law lines around. But it's not a medically approved drug, so this is the courts forcing doctors to prescribe a drug that there are no clinical trials for, or, or not enough. There's no real empirical data. Um, from my understanding, that says this strain of cannabis in this dosage reduces or improves this condition. And so if you're a doctor, uh, you're now faced with pressure from your college, which is not favorable, right, all the way to the Quebec college literally saying it's unethical for you to prescribe. So you have a spectrum of colleges um, that aren't in agreement. And most colleges saying tread very, very carefully. And, and then you don't have any dosage information. And uh, when the program first started, prior to the Smith decision, you are prescribing a drug um, to a patient that can only be inhaled, right? That, that you're, you're prescribing dried cannabis that uh, has to be smoked or vaporized, and vaporizers are, are healthier or you're going to be relying on your patient to go and create their home extracts or derivatives, which is equally as dangerous. So um, I, think, I think a lot of the public lost perception where you know, it was a great thing, now medical patients have access to medical cannabis, everybody should be on board. Um, but I really, after talking to a lot of doctors, as Hugo said, I mean, we definitely understand their position, which is just, we don't have enough information to go and prescribe this. And on top of this, on top of that, we're prescribing this as either a supplement or as an alternative to other medications that we do have information on. So if I'm gonna prescribe you a painkiller that I know that works in these, this box, and I'm gonna now tell you, or you're gonna ask me, and I'm gonna say, okay, don't worry about that. Let me provide you something that we have little to no evidence on. Uh, and when I say evidence, I mean the evidence that doctors would like to see. So that was that's a problem. We have I haven't seen. I don't think you guys either. Doctors being reprimanded for over prescribing. Not that that hasn't happened. I just haven't seen it. So it's it's more on the set uh, on the other side of uh, being hesitant. That's a great question. Just want to add to that perspective is that as a licensed producer, we must in regulations as defined by the regulation send to the colleges a list of all doctors that have prescribed our product. Right. So there, was an amend, yeah, there was an amendment in 2014 to the MMPR which effectively said the college they can request it monthly. Yeah, if, if, if there are a college of physicians requests that a licensed producer provide to you, provides information, you have to share, you have to tell them every doctor that's prescribed in your jurisdiction. So if it's Ontario, you don't have to tell them about Alberta doctors, you can just tell them about Ontario plus patients. So, you know, there, there is, and when you submit your medical document to a licensed producer to register, the licensed producer has an obligation to phone that doctor and verify. Um, so, I know that, but all the licensed producers have their individual patient list. So, what role from both, um, but practical and confidentiality based perspective to to see the merger merger happen because I know one of the biggest obstacles to cross provincial L LPs merging 
if the patient lives of one life producer doesn't doesn't automatically transfer even if like they merge in, in the corporate sector, which creates like a dilemma for patients because they have to go through a process of like unregistering and re-registering with the new new merge entity. So that's a great one. I don't, I don't yeah. Yeah. So it's an excellent question. We've we dealt with that issue once, but it was a Ontario Ontario merger. Um, generally speaking, you know, you're allowed to disclose even medical information if the patient has consented. There's informed consent. So what you will find in almost all <coughs> sophisticated LPs, you know, there's, there's always a couple of outliers that are very small and they have, you know, haven't thought through that issue. And those are the problems because those are usually the targets. You know, you'll have smaller outfits that maybe are a bit less sophisticated and a big entity coming and they'll find that you actually didn't put in your terms of service that we can share your, your personal information with our affiliates, including you know, there is a business acquisition exemption. Um, so most sophisticated LPs, when you go on their terms of service, you go onto their privacy policy, they will have express terms saying, when you register with us, you are consenting to us sharing your information with but, our affiliates. Sorry, I, I'm more than, like, in terms of their license under the MMPR, even with a corporate Mer like a corporate merger, that license doesn't, it's still with whatever and the original entity was. So that, li that license has to be amended to account and for the new entity, which means that the legitimate custom or clients or whatever you want to call them have to w wait for like the reapplication process and I, I see like more concentration in the market as an eventuality so is there a stream do you see a streamlining process for like the amendment of licenses? Yeah, so I think it's important. Like, um, so far, there's been no true amalgamation where one LP buys another and then just one entity continues. You know, everything's been share acquisition where one LP acquires all the shares together and now has a subsidiary. Right? So you'll have someone when Tweed bought Bedrocan, it wasn't actually Tweed that bought it. Tweed has a license. They're owned by a parent corporation called Canopy Road Corporation. It used to be called Tweed Marijuana Inc. They bought all the shares of Bedrocan. Bedrocan maintains its own license and its own patient base. So that's interesting because you're looking forward to if will there be an actual amalgamation? And it, it won't happen because a license attaches to the municipal property. So if I have a, a, a like if I have a license in Ontario and I want to buy a licensed producer in British Columbia, you will never get a situation where they combine and they're a new entity and sort of like how do you merge the licenses because you can't these guys will keep have a, two licenses yeah these guys will have a production facility that has a license and these guys will have a license that attaches to the production facility you will need like there's no consent right <coughs> under the MMPR on Canada can say no you can't do this deal but you do it is an interactive process because yeah. there's security clear people at each end of the yeah. have to stay on. First, a quick com <clears throat> comment on the doctors. It seems to me the medical profession is expressing considerable hypocrisy. They're more than willing, uh, with the uh, support of the pharmaceutical industry, to prescribe billions of dollars of drugs, for example, elderly over 70 barbiturates, which are off-label and for which there are no clinical trials, no evidence, and indeed they're contraindicated. But anyway, quick comment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the docs. I think they're. Uh, behaving in a sometimes rather outrageous way. If I can ask, I'm not a lawyer, but a question. You know, does the international, do the international conventions that you were referring to impose any restrictions on the flexibility of Canadian law? Yeah, so uh, 
we've been, we've been discussing that, since Kevin, uh, Virginia, and I, uh, we've been doing research on that. So our understanding is that if Canada do, if Canada wants to go forward, uh, they will have to look at the three conventions, um, and maybe a good way of doing that would be looking at other countries uh, who have dealt with either decriminalization or legalization and, and trying to find a way. So maybe looking at Portugal that have decriminalized but not legalized, or the Netherlands, or Bolivia who has changed the constitution. So uh, that would be. Yeah, so there's three conventions. They're voluntary. You know, principle of international <coughs> law is sort of, you know, primacy of the sovereign nation. Usually when you join one of these conventions, right, you, you can make reservations. You can say, I'm going to follow this convention, but I want a reservation <coughs> on this particular item. If a third, a third of the countries that are party to the convention oppose, then the reservation is not accepted. So there is some precedent of this. I think Bolivia in 2009, I guess wrong, I'm not the dates, but Bolivia actually tried to sort of you, you can either amend, so you can ask the rest of the party to say, look, I, I want to make an amendment to my obligations under this convention. Uh, Bolivia tried to do that with chewing cocoa leaves, and it was denied. There was opposition. So what they actually did is they withdrew from the convention and then rejoined, but well, with a reservation for cocoa leaves. It was opposed by 15, I think, of the 61 countries, which wasn't enough. <coughs> negate the reservation. So now they're party to the convention with a reservation for cocoa leaves. And, you know, so, so there are ways. It's certainly something that the government will have to consider in a legalization context, because you also do have to provide certain you know, guesstimates. That's really what they are for production capacity. And that's quite hard when you have things like universal home growing and things like that, where there's not accurate reporting going on. So that's definitely an issue, but I don't think it'll be a determinant. I wondered if these two gentlemen would have find so so real, you know, just a Trudeau liberalizing marijuana. What is the regulatory future there? In ten years' time, how will what what's your best guess on how uh, we will be consuming <coughs> marijuana uh, and in what kind of regulatory world are we looking at? So this morning before we came here, we met with the head of policy implementation at the Office of Medical Cannabis and the deputy. For me to film, so oh. just tell me the end. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really. We can make that all static. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no disclosure. It's going to be in the lobby documents anyway. Yeah, and, and what I sort of. And we were talking about kind of. So one of them is transitioning over to run the bureaucratic office for the eventual sort of legalization regime. Really, it's going to be really service through different ministers. So it's kind of a position. Um, but I think as we've obviously done a lot of thinking, talking about well, how, but from a commercial perspective, like how will the market evolve? What does that mean for us? What does right. that mean for our clients? But obviously, the regulation, or the re-regulation. Re-regulation. So what does that mean? Well, so I think you get so when the, the the task force is being created, that one member, and I think when you get to it, you're going to come to a few crossroads really quickly. So I think the first crossroad you come to is division of powers. So is this a federal system, or do they wipe cannabis out of the CDSA and they lose constitutional jurisdiction at a federal level? Or do you have a federal provincial agreement and right. the courts give it away to the not because it's co-opted federal? Right. If I had to make a bet, that's probably where you went out. Um, I think it's a mistake to take it out of the federal regime. I mean, part of what makes our system very attractive to outside capital in both as a model for other countries that come to us and say, hey, help, help us understand your system as we try and develop our own policy, is the fact that it's federally regulated, so there's uniform standards, because, especially in a medical context, so a recreational context, I'm a rec user, and my access is a little bit different in Ontario than it is in British Columbia, because the provinces there have a, provincial, have a more liberal attitude. I don't care. I was like, whatever. It's still better than when I had to go and phone the dealer or do all these things. But if I have a child who's very ill and I think that a certain product improves their quality of life dramatically, and I don't have access to that in Ontario, but I do in British Columbia, and I don't, I don't have that sort of luxury of unrestricted mobility into that jurisdiction, I'll mortgage my house to see. Right? Like I will 
you know, then I'll, I will bring a charter challenge. So I think, you know, the way you could do it is you could just pass a Section 56 exemption for individuals over a certain age, and they got to comply with certain terms and conditions in order to get cannabis. So you, you could keep it federal, and I think my perspective is that's the way I would want to keep it. I don't know if that's the way it will happen, especially maybe, you know, if there's a dual track medical recreational, maybe they'll keep it that way. They'll give feds more jurisdiction at a medical level than at a rec level. I think you also get to a crossroads about a, do you just make it recreational? You take the burden off doctors and say, you know what, like forget the doctors don't want to prescribe, so we'll just make this everyone. It's recreational for everyone. Everyone has the same right. You want cannabis, whether it's for a medical reason or a recreational reason, go and get it. I think that will result in a lot of litigation as well because if it's a medicine, if you need it for medical reason, it trickles down into other areas. It trickles down into an employer's duty to accommodate. It trickles down into is there an HST exemption if the drug eventually becomes zero rated? Is there insurance coverage? So none of that applies to recreational use. Your doctor has no obligation to accommodate the recreational use of any drug. So I could see that being a real difficulty. So I think there will be you know, a, a large degree of federal oversight. I think there will be a dual track for both constitutional reasons, but also for taxation reasons. You'll, you'll be what able about to, things like warnings on the cigarette packages? And that's very, that's, and that's, I'll tell you, that is amongst our clients, that's a big concern. Right. Is it tobacco or alcohol? Because if it's tobacco, zero advertising. So how do you differentiate your brand from any other brand when you haven't had that history of lots of promotional advertising tobacco? So what do you think is going to happen on that? We actually have to bring Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and for, I know that there were some outstanding questions, but we do, we are at time and to let, yeah, yeah. So please uh, join me in thanking our